Good morning, it's Friday. If you're new here, for some reason, I'm reviewing, in giant quotation marks, every chapter of this book, The Anthropocene Reviewed, which itself is a series of essay reviews on everything from sunsets to the opening sequence of Penguins in Madagascar, rated on a five-star scale by John Green. Some chapters leave me with more to say about the Anthropocene, or the age we humans have and will continue living in, than others, so today, we're doing two. In Piggly Wiggly. Down home. Down the street. The story of founder Clarence Saunders, who, to put it lightly, reshaped the way grocery stores worked, had a string of astonishing successes and failures along his long career, and in Green's retelling of this cautionary tale of American capitalism's cruelty, the big getting bigger by eating the small and all that, we see how an eccentric mind like Saunders was capable of creating and losing his own transformative businesses to the games of Wall Street and shorting the stock. In 1922, this is not a new problem. John Green concludes that Saunders' own eccentricity, faults otherwise doesn't really stick as much as how quickly American capitalism can turn on itself. And as I think on the tale of Clarence Saunders, I look towards the titans of industry and businesses today, from the Elon Musks to the Jeff Bezos, and wonder if they will be eaten by a still bigger shark. Or, like Vince McMahon of the WWE recently, if they'll end up eating themselves alive in scandal and shame. You want to let me finish here for a second, pal? Shut your mouth and let me answer the question, all right? I'll be happy to answer. Or like those that bet the GameStop would fail if they'll get eaten by the public at large. Until balance is restored, of course, that is to say, by making the poor people stop trying to not be poor. But Clarence Saunders was rich and poor and rich and poor again. As journalist Ernie Peel said, and Green quoted in this essay, if Saunders lives long enough, Memphis will become the most beautiful city in the world just with the things Saunders built and lost. In a way, I envy Saunders and broadly successful businessmen like him. They work tirelessly, but they find not just one calling, but several. There is a need to create and work and outmanipulate the rest that I'd find appealing, but then again, there'd be little room for appreciating and enjoying the smaller things in life, or more importantly, maintaining a relatively clear moral compass. This is a bad segue. The Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest essay, because if we can't enjoy competitive hot dog eating, then what can we enjoy? I'm not going to talk about the contest itself for long, though, because that would involve using footage of the Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest, and I like you, so I won't. But I will touch on the ending of this essay as it rounds back to the story of Piggly Wiggly and Clarence Saunders, where it's noted that hype men like George Shea, who depicted the victory of American Joey Chestnut over previous six-time winner Japanese Takeru Kobayashi with a bit too much of a pro-America bent, we have our confidence back, he said. The dark days of the past six years are behind us. Inadvertently caused the crowd to begin throwing racial slurs and jabs at the crestfallen Kobayashi, who said through tears, they used to cheer for me. Of course, George Shea hyping up the crowd, bringing in competitive food eaters with introductions like, he stands before us like Hercules himself, albeit a large bald Hercules at an eating contest was a joke, and most everyone was in on the joke. Most everyone. Modern carnival barkers, as John Green put it, like George Shea, have a voice that is listened to. That's excellent foreshadowing on the next chapter by Green there, but not just in hot dog eating contests, but in big business, market moves are often discussed like a game, like something not quite reality, almost a joke. But Clarence Saunders and slightly less eccentric business titans like him today are also listened to. Their words have a weight that they themselves may not appreciate, but it is there. I suppose our words have weight too, and we should appreciate that even as we cast stones at those living in nicer, bigger glass houses. I'm left with only one conclusion from these two essays, from the story of Clarence Saunders' eccentric business heights and lows and George Shea's carny-hyped antics and their unfortunate results. What we see in the news, in business, and politics, and in hot dog eating contests is a great circus. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't, when necessary, be taken seriously. And speaking of circuses, what's the next chapter in this book? Oh my god.